Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm uh, Peter Lee, and uh, I have really the great pleasure of uh, introducing our uh, visiting speaker. I'm saying visiting, I'm hesitating there because uh, Dana is actually one of our own, and so she's, uh, she is visiting from the other coast, but, uh, uh, but feels very much close to us. Uh, so let me uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dana Boyd to you. Um, she is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research um, and part of our uh, social media collective, which is really turning into a dynamic and uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, and impactful uh, group of people looking at a broad range of uh, social science and social media issues. Uh, Dana is also a research assistant professor at uh, NYU uh, in the Media, Culture, and Communications program uh, and a fellow at the Harvard uh, Berkman Center for Internet uh, and Society. Um, she is, uh, I think, broadly acknowledged as a leading authority, perhaps the leading authority, on the interaction between American youth and social media, and in particular in the dynamic of that interaction in the broader context of a society and a society of adults that sometimes has uh, certain preconceptions and fears uh, about what that all means. Um, and in fact, uh, I think we'll hear something about that uh, today as she tells us about her book, uh, It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens. Um, for her work, uh, Dana is, um, on top of her own research and her own field study, also uh, extremely active in the world and in uh, various communities. Uh, she's been recognized uh, by the MIT Technology Review uh, as one of the top uh, uh, TR35 innovators. Uh, Fortune magazine uh, called her the smartest person, uh, the smartest academic. I guess that's not quite a person. Uh, <laughs> the, the smartest academic in technology. Um, she is part of the Social Media Global Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum uh, and on the board of the directors of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Uh, but for all of that, of course, what's most important to know is her Twitter handle, which is Zephoria, starting with a Z. Uh, and um, my first lesson uh, when I joined Microsoft uh, and interacted with her for the first time by email uh, was to learn that her name begins with a lowercase d and a lowercase b. So uh, with that, please uh, welcome Dana Boyd. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to be here and to talk about my book uh, and to be able to spend so much time uh, sharing what I've been doing for the last decade with all of you. Uh, now, I've been told that there are different reasons why some of you are here, and so I want to get a sense of uh, who in the room is here for what. How many of you are researchers in one sense or another? Okay, so there's a hand for you. How many of you are parents and worried about your kids in one way or another? All right. How many of you have been told that you should come here for some privacy-related reason because you get credit in some way or another? Um, <laughs> I've all heard that this is happening. Uh, and how many of you have been guilted into coming because you're my friend? Um, <laughs> they're in the front row. See, this is how this works. Um, so I want to put this book into some sort of context to give you a way of understanding it, a way of relating to it, and hopefully to encourage you to read it. Um, but I also want to do it in a way where we can have a conversation. So I'm going to give you this overview and then invite you to start asking questions pretty quickly into the process. First, some context. Um, I was one of the first generation of young people who really grew up online. I got online in the early 1990s um, because my brother was doing the terrible, terrible thing of using the phone line um, to make beepy sounds with his computer. And I didn't understand what was going, in, uh, going on. And I marched into his room. And I was like, what are you doing? And he showed me a world of Usenet and bulletin boards 
words, and I realized that that computer was made of people. And it made me much more interested in what was happening with that device. Um, and so I spent my teen years um, hanging out in all sorts of online communities, talking to strangers. Um, and the reason I thought this was interesting is, is that it was not a big deal. The fact that they were strangers was not something we thought of at that moment. Um, and for me, as a, uh, a teenager growing up in rural Pennsylvania, it was extraordinarily empowering to have these conversations with people from such different worldviews and different experiences. So this was during the first Gulf War, and I spent a lot of time talking to uh, folks fighting for the US military in, um, in the Middle East, um, trying to understand geopolitics. I spent a lot of time talking to a transgender woman who helped me a uh, answer and understand gender and sexuality by asking unbelievably inappropriate, naive questions. Um, but these moments of being able to understand a world beyond my own were what made me fall radically and magically in love with this technology. I went to Brown to study computer science in the hopes that I could build the systems um, that I was uh, so passionate about. Um, and then I started doing a lot of visualizations, um, trying to understand relationships between networks. Uh, and I started visualizing the early graphs of environments that I was involved in, Usenet, mailing lists, uh, email, et cetera. Um, and I received a phone call in um, December of 2002 uh, from one of the sponsors of the Media Lab, I was at the Media Lab by this point, um, who said there was a new site launching called Friendster. I might find it really interesting. And so I checked this out, and mind you, for the timing of it all, the first Village Voice article written about Friendster was in June of 2003. So this is six months before that. And I was like, this is a really fascinating environment, and it has all of the feel of a lot of the early social technologies. And so I was really intrigued by it. So I started you know, playing around on the site, and I started documenting what I was seeing. I started documenting what I was seeing on my blog. And this is also sort of a funny history of it, that I actually started blogging in 1997 before anybody knew that there was a thing called blogging. So here I was blogging about this thing that was emergent within social media. And um, I got a phone call from somebody being like, hey, can you help us understand these new technologies? Can we hire you to um, do focus groups and research and whatnot? I'm like, I have no money. I'm out of grad school. Sure, of course, I had no idea what I was doing, uh, which made the whole thing pretty entertaining. And I basically ended up doing a crash course and trying to learn how to do qualitative methods on the fly. Um, and then I realized that I actually wanted to go back to grad school, and maybe I should learn how to do this more properly. So I went back to Berkeley um, and trained under a group of anthropologists in order to understand the cultural logic, the understanding of why people use technologies in the way that they did. Um, and I was, you know, all the meanwhile, I was studying what was happening with all of the social media issues, the questions of blogging. But my advisor came to me and he said, hey, I've got some funding. I really want to look at um, young people and their relationship to technology. Would you be interested? And I was like, sure. I'd love to see how much had changed since I had grown up online. And I could take a break from all this social media stuff. That'll be really fun, right? And so I figured I would go and I would go back and look at Live Journal and Zango, which were sort of the things of young people, Instant Messenger, that kind of thing. Um, and I sort of signed up to do this project basically just as teenagers started to get onto MySpace. And so what ended up happening is I was well positioned to watch the rise and fall of MySpace and the rise, and I would argue now, fall of Facebook. Um, and now in this moment where we're seeing the proliferation of a ton of different apps. In this project, I sort of, you know, I wanted to understand this at an intellectual level. I wanted to understand what were the cultural dynamics playing out. Um, but the thing that I quickly came up against was all of these anxieties by the public. Um, the press started covering social media by talking about all of the terrible things that kids do online. Um, indeed, parents started coming to me all, and anxious. Policymakers started trying to find new ways of legislating these new technologies. And I kept scratching my head, being like, where is this disconnect? How can we understand this? And that's where I decided to do something sort of more public, which is that you know, for the longest time as a scholar, of course, I write a lot of journal articles. I write a, a lot of traditional academic output. But I wanted to be able to put this material into the hands of people who might be able to use it, might be able to make a difference in young people's lives. And so I wrote this book 
very much sort of building off of a decade of research, um, a way of looking at young people across the United States, and we can talk about methods if those you know, want to. Um, but I really wanted to sort of do a deep dive, connect what I was seeing on the ground with what people were seeing um, in, in other research communities, and try to address these different points of anxiety. Um, and so each chapter in this book takes on a different concern. Sometimes these are concerns where we, we, we are really worried about kids. This is about you know, the idea that they might not care about privacy or that bullying is an issue, issues of sexual um, interactions online, these kinds of concerns about kids. But there's also the questions of all of the hopes that we have. These moments about how the internet was going to be our saving grace. It was going to you know, radically transform you know, the questions of inequality in this country. The idea that young people are digital natives, that somehow things fall from the sky and they magically understand technology. And I wanted to take each of these different concerns and sort of untangle them. Where was this myth rooted in something that was really real? And where was things far more complicated? And part of it was because you know, as I started on this field work, I realized that my experience as a teenager was not what everybody was experiencing. And in fact, what had really changed um, in the five years from when, I be, from when I was a teenager to when I sort of started the project, and then of course the 10 years um, um, since, what had really, really changed significantly was the fact that it had become mainstream. And young people had gone online basically to socialize with their friends. And that's where we are today. So then I started figuring out we needed to untangle why it is that young people are going and spending so much time online. Indeed, a lot of adults would come to me being like, this is terrible, they're all online, why are they not doing what we did as kids? It must be something about the technology. But there's a lot that have changed in the last 30 years in American society that we don't account for. Um, and it's really important to lay some of that out to then understand these other implications. Um, over the last 30 years, we've seen the rise of curfew laws, um, the increase of young people not being allowed out into public places after certain hours. We have seen an increase in suburbanization, um, and with it, the aspects of school choice, and schools actually being built out far out in suburbia. The result of which is that for a lot of young people in this country, they're, they're not able to walk to school with their friends. Their friends are more likely to live at a much greater distance that even if they could get on a bike, they can't get to them. Therefore, they're increasingly dependent on their parents' cars to get them to places. Um, parents are more likely to be working, which makes it really challenging in coordinating um, these dynamics. Um, public places have started telling uh, young people that they're not wanted. Malls have restrictions, um, questions of trespassing laws that radically change um, parking lots and other public hangout spaces. Um, we have an amazing amount of fear mongering that has come in and restricted young people. The access to expendable capital has changed, which is that you know when I was growing up, by the time I was 12, I was babysitting. And I can't imagine most of the middle class communities I go into now allowing a 12-year-old to babysit a three-year-old. Um, and then, of course, that's the black market money making of, of babysitting. But then there's a whole universe of things like um, fast food, which has really changed because we actually have those jobs for 50-somethings now. And we can't imagine our young people participating in it. Another sort of radical change is that um, in response to latchkey culture in the 1980s in the US, we started overstructuring young people's lives in the hopes that this would keep them safe and keep them occupied. And so especially in middle upper class communities, young people go from very early in the morning when they shouldn't be biologically awake until pretty late at night in very structured activities. And by the time they're done with homework, they're done with dinner, it's 9 o'clock, all they want to do is hang out with their friends. And rather than sneaking out there windows, breaking their legs, what they end up doing is spending all their time on these technologies. Um, they end up finding that this is the place where their friends are. And at the beginning of my research, what was really interesting about this you know, dynamic was that it was a relatively public act of participating in these environments because adults really didn't notice. They weren't paying attention to what was happening. By the mid-2000s, when we started really being anxious about young people and their relationship to technology, all of a sudden, adults became part of the picture. And the one thing that radically changed over the decade that I was doing this work were the issues about privacy. Which is that when I began this, teenagers were not really thinking about privacy with regard to adults because they weren't really worried about it. They were just trying to find their friends by any means possible. This was the one place where they could gather. By the time their parents were on Facebook, they were sort of struggling with a different issue, which is that they wanted the ability to speak to their friends and they had to deal with their parents simultaneously. And they had to deal with, regardless of what the privacy settings required in the systems, all it required was to mom to look over your shoulder and it ruined everything. 
everything. Or for your kid's sibling to think it was really funny to get onto your account, right? And that also caused you know, absolute mayhem. And so what I saw was this amazing shift of young people switching from thinking about hiding um, or th restricting access to content to restricting access to meaning, ways of hiding in plain sight. So let me give you an ethnographic example from this that I think is sort of fun, especially in a really geeky room, um, which is that um, I was talking to a young woman uh, in Boston, and she's of Argentinian descent, which is important to note because her mother has no reference to British culture, um, and no understanding of British culture, and more importantly, uh, geeky culture writ large. And she and her friends are rather relatively geeky. Now, she and her boyfriend had just broken up, and she f wanted to find a way to tell all of her friends that she was having a lousy, lousy day. She wanted their love, she wanted their support, she wanted their validation, um, and so she was tr trying to figure out how to express her emotions. Now, if you um, haven't spent time with a lot of 16-year-olds, you will find that a lot of them spend uh, time thinking about the perfect song lyric to express emotions, right? That's the best way to convey it. So she was trying to find the right song lyric, and she knew if she put up a sappy song li lyric, her mother would flip out. It had happened before, she puts things up, her mother thinks she's suicidal, it, it just doesn't work well. So she was trying to find a song lyric that would allow her to signal to her friends that things were not doing so well, but not trigger her mom. So she puts up song lyrics from Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Now for those who don't know the Monty Python reference, this is a song in the life of Brian when the key character is being crucified. There is nothing happy about this song, right? But she puts up the lyrics, her mother reads them literally and, and immediately s sends a comment on Facebook, it looks like you're having a great day. And her friends immediately text her, right? And it's this beautiful way in which she was able to signal something in multiple frames. And I think that this is really important because this is one of the ways in which I'm seeing privacy start to play out in really magnificent ways amongst young people. It started textually, and in fact you will hear things like subtweeting, um, which is a way of sort of encoding things. The use of pronouns is particularly popular, right? Basically, oh my gosh, can you believe what she said? Oh no, I can't believe what he did, right? And it's like, clearly there's a conversation there and everybody knows what's going on except me, right? And that's part of the change that has happened. Um, so these young people are extraordinary extraordinarily visible because they're dealing with immediate power, they find ways of encoding their material. Meanwhile, of course, we're actually seeing a shift right now to visual culture. And this, I think, is a really interesting trigger and shift of what's going on. It's now about Snapchat. It's now about Instagram and Vine. It's the idea of putting up visual material. And what's really funny in this is that there's a lot of references here that you don't have a clue what you're seeing or why you're seeing it. So I was sitting with a, a teen boy who'd put up um, a picture of a donut, and I was like, what's up with the donut, right? Like, and he's like, oh, and of course it has this long story of friends and you know, jokes and you know, things that have bubbled into laughter, and I didn't even understand what he was talking about. But he knew that when he put up this picture of a donut that his friends would burst out laughing, which is indeed what happened. And so this is this way in which we're seeing these kinds of communicative acts in very visible environments. Um, but what's really important to note about this is that what we see is with each new technology, young people are desperately trying to find a way of finding a place of their own, a place where they can just hang out, a place where they can joke around, a place where they can do all of the dumb things that all of us did when we were teenagers. Only they're doing it through different technologically mediated ways, in ways that often look foreign and strange to adults. And I think that you know, one of the struggles that I found in, in researching this book is that young people kept coming to me and being like, why do my parents think I'm in so much trouble because of what I do online? I'm not. I'm OK. Can't you just tell them? And so I wrote this book in a hope to reach out to the public and say, by and large, guess what? The kids are all right. Those who aren't are making visible online how much they're struggling offline. If we want to make a difference in young people's lives, let's not blame the technology, think that the technology is the thing that's the magical transformation. Let's use this as a window into young people's lives in order to embrace them, in order to help them, in order to challenge them, and in order to give them tremendous opportunities. And with that, I sort of, there's so many different directions that we can go, and I want to sort of see where you want to go. Um, I've been, oh, the mics pick up from the air, so just try to talk loudly and I'll try to repeat your questions. Who in the room, what direction do you want me to go? Go! Hi, this is great. Thanks for coming. No problem. Um, I'm here because I'm a parent of a teen <laughs> who's very social networked. Snapchat, Twitter, subtweets <laughs> is something I just found out about. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> What I struggle with as a parent, and I wonder what your research shows, is the extent to which parents really ought to be monitoring versus 
letting them have their independence in their own space because Snapchat scares the hell out of me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to attack this in a couple different ways. I'm going to actually start with the very simple bit of Snapchat, um, and then I'm going to get into your broader question. Snapchat is actually a really beautiful transformation of technology, and I think it's underappreciated about what it does. Um, Adults are the ones sending naked images. By and large, teenagers are not. Um, <laughs> what teenagers are doing is saying, why do we need to save every photograph that ever existed? Why does this need to go permanent? And I think that there's really an interesting moment, because all of these technologies to date have been about persistence. And I kept seeing young people trying to find innovative, innovative ways of getting around persistence. Um, and then all of a sudden, they have this tool where they can sort of make things more ephemeral and try to keep it lighter weight. That's one. There's a second really important thing. If if you're following a lot of people, I don't know how many of you use Twitter or Instagram or whatnot, when you've got these streams of things, you're just flying them by, you're paying no attention to anything, it's just going, you, you, you might like things here and there, but otherwise you ignore it. When you get something on Snapchat, it says, pay attention to me for six seconds. That's all you've got, pay attention. And it's a really interesting way of saying, I am saying that this is for you and I'm asking you to give me your attention. I think that's a really delightful thing. Now, in light of um, your, your sort of broader and, and more important question, which is, you know, how do we understand what it means to monitor young people? Today's young people are more age segregated than any previous generation in the United States. What that means is that young people have very limited opportunities to interact with non-custodial adults um, in, than in previous generations. So their interactions with adults primarily are parents, teachers, or other people who hold immediate power over them. This becomes really challenging as we transition into the high school years. There is no doubt that the high school years are about trying to find independence, trying to find your own footing, trying to find your way of relating to the world. When we make this just about your peer group, it creates all sorts of skew, screwy dynamics. Um, what we need to be doing is finding other ways of uh, supporting young people to have a a lot of adults that they can turn to that are not just you. Um, and this is something that we should be thinking about how to engender very early on. The first piece of advice that I give to parents is that from the time your child is tiny, build an entire network of other cool adults that they can turn to. The aunts, the uncles, the older cousins, the coaches, the youth ministers, whatever that is fits into your community, find those other adults. The reason is, is that once you get to the high school years, they're going to invite those cool people into their accounts even as they kick you off. Um, and they're going to basically, those other adults, are not going to tattle on your child when your child swears, but they're going to tattle when something looks really serious. And so that structure becomes really, really important. And I think it's one of the things we, we underestimate um, in, in today's environment. Now, in terms of um, sort of how you deal with this as a parent, part of it is, is that you know, I get from young people all the time their frustration that their parents don't trust them. Their frustration that their parents, even when they're well-intended, are not giving them the ability to be independent. And I think that it's actually a fair critique in an American society. And it's really tricky, I'll say, with my college hat on, nothing drives me more bonkers than dealing with American youth at the age of 18 showing up on my campus and having never experienced any form of freedom because they don't handle it well. So one of the challenges is that you actually have to socialize your children into freedom. And it's not a magical age. It's not like all of a sudden they're 13 and they can go and do whatever. It's a process. And it's a process of, of letting them go a little further and seeing how it goes and sort of saying, hey, that's enough, and trying to go back and forth. And you want to encourage an, a situation in which they get bumps and bruises but don't break bones, right? Like it's this moment of how do you give them enough freedom and sort of figure it out. Now, the process of achieving this, no parenting checklist can actually solve this for you. And I hate the whole world of parenting advice that's like, here's a checklist. So what I would argue is you have to start with your values. What are your values in your household? What's important to you? And what are the different mechanisms that you can use to get that? Some parents use um, social contracts, which are really an interesting experiment. Some people use a lot of different symbolism. So for example, one of the things that I've often offered parents about online material is the piggy bank solution. The piggy bank solution is to go and buy a piggy bank, the kind that actually has to be broken to get into, right? Go and put this in your house and say everyone in the house, parents and kids, put their passwords in this piggy bank. And put the date on them so that when you change your password, you can put the new paper in without it being confusing. Um, put all those passwords into it. And what we're gonna say is that if 
I feel like I'm worried about you, I'm going to break that piggy bank and get access. But I'm not going to use this just as a moment of surveillance. I'm going to use this in order to say, hey, things have reached a level of discomfort. And the funny thing is, is that by you putting your passwords in too, they can also say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to hold this over you too. Now, this does not work in all households. It really depends on the dynamics within your own, um, within your environment and your house. But the thing is, is that that moment of building something that is symbolically about trust goes an amazingly long way. And so this is what, what are the symbolisms of trust? What are the ways in which you can support that? What are the communicative strategies that you can work with in your household to achieve that? And there's not going to be a one size fits all for this room, but I would strongly encourage all of you to find ways to slowly give your children freedom over an extended period of time. Because when they're 18, it's not like the magical understanding of how the public world works falls down from the sky. It really is a process. Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah. Um, so you talked about some of the changes in the environment, you know, um, geographical distance and not being able to make money, being, you know, physical meeting points, et cetera, et cetera, and how that's driving kids maybe towards some of these um, technologies. Have you done research in other cultures and geographies where, you know, those changes may not have occurred and how is, what differences do you see in adoption of these technologies? And no, it's a good question, and it's um, so I spend a lot of time with other researchers. I have not done field work in these other countries, but I spend time with other researchers have, and we spend a lot of time comparing notes. Um, certain things are sort of really funnily weird about the United States, although the UK and Australia do a pretty good job of emulating us in ways that are not particularly good um, around all forms of fear mongering. Um, Outside of those three countries, what you end up seeing is a lot more freedom and physical space. So the result of which is that, for example, Italy, right? Italy was on mobile phones so much faster than the United States, right? Because their kids had freedom to, to physically roam. The US was actually one of the latest adoptions for all forms of texting and mobile phone usage. Of course, our economics around um, the mobile phone were also really weird because think about it. I'm going to pay 10 cents to send and to receive messages. So I'm going to send you a message, here pay 10 cents. That's just weird. We were the only country who did that and it really stifled text messaging in really notable ways. So things actually were more about the mobile phone in other countries um, in ways that they weren't in the US. Whereas young people in the US were more likely to have um, you know, access to a computer in middle upper class environments and be on that much you know, more more intensely than anywhere else. And so if you see even something like Facebook, which went across the globe, the usage patterns around Facebook are so different per cultural context, even when you stabilize across youth. And so for example, you know, in a lot of um, you know, southern European countries, it was really always about a photo sharing app. It was about getting together with your friends and taking pictures. And you know, the idea that selfies only became an American thought this last year is crazy, because that stuff has been going on for a long time everywhere else with different words. Um, so there's just these weird dynamics of it. And what you realize is that these technologies fit into what the social practices look like. And those social practices play out differently in different cultural environments with young people. Um, you know, I, you know, I struggle with it because, you know, the other, there are other dynamics play out also differently and we can, we can talk about that sort of later, which is, you know, issues like bullying. Bullying look very different around the globe, um, in part because of how we age segregate, where other countries do not have the same sort of age segregation. So their di dynamics around meanness cruelty look different. Um, also for that matter, socioeconomic status really affects these issues. So they're, they're all kind of different and most of what I'm sort of laying out for you is the things that most significantly affected middle and upper class America. American society, um, working class American society has had a sort of different contour around all of this. But yeah, it, it does vary, um, and I'm happy to sort of offline talk with you about specific countries if you're really curious. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned uh, hyperlocal memes with a donut. Can you compare hyperlocal to say global memes? Yeah. And, and how many of these start local and go global, and how many go the other direction? Um. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them oriented around teenagers um, and the teenagers' practices. One of my favorite things uh, was actually when I started talking to journalists about Twitter. And they were just like, oh, we hear Twitter is really, really popular amongst teenagers. And I was like, yeah, but they're not using the service the same way you are. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, they don't send URLs out. And they were like, really? Then what do they do? And I'm like, there's this thing called hashtag. Um, and so one of the things that was really funny in early days of Twitter when young people started getting on it is they started playing with hashtags. And they did so in order to actually play with a larger audience. Justin Bieber was a driving function of a lot of this, um, but there was a lot of playfulness beyond that. 
What was really interesting about that kind of meme culture is that it was predominantly driven by youth from um, more urban environments and more working class communities. Um, and part of it was that they were less afraid of being out in public. And when I would interact with teenagers about this, they would, they would basically say, you know, what do, what do I have to lose, right? Like these, these, this is a great opportunity. I can connect, I can be a part of something much bigger. And they were much more willing to do that kind of playfulness. There's one other really important factor in all of this, um, and that is 4chan. Um, for those who are not familiar with 4chan, do not look it up. Read the Wikipedia entry, and please don't go any further. You will feel much happier about the universe this way. Um, <laughs> 4chan is basically the underbelly of the internet, uh, and it has all of the logic of a 15-year-old boy, um, which means uh, complete with a lot of 15-year-old boy humor and 15-year-old boy sexuality desires. Um, so like I said, don't look it up. Um, but the thing that was really interesting about 4chan is it was created by um, a 15-year-old boy who at the time uh, didn't want to tell his mother that he was running an international s um, system out of his home. Um, and so in order to not let his mother know this, he couldn't ask for more server space. Um, and so he did something really funny. He made it so that um, in the forum that he had created, once things went off the front page, he deleted them because he didn't want to store them, because he couldn't afford to store them, because that would require more servers and more bandwidth and a whole variety of other things. And so in order for things to get then back to the top of the page, people needed to repost it. What people quickly realized is that if they reposted it, they could modify it. And many of the most absurd memes that we've seen that have become highly visible, think, think lolcat, right, those pictures of, of cats with impact font, um, that came out and that originated in 4chan. Now what's really phenomenal about 4chan and a lot of its um, cultural ecosystem is that just like my cohort of geeky kids decided that we would hack the security economy for fun, um, therefore getting us into a lot of trouble as teenagers, this cohort has decided to hack the attention economy. And so they purposefully tried to play with different memes that they would try to see of ways of disrupting up. Um, my favorite of which was the, when they decided to punk um, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey had been on one of her sort of scaremongering, um, terrible things are falling from the sky, kids are in trouble uh, messages for a while. And so amongst the 4chan uh, community, they basically decided to, talk, to convince um, Oprah that Pedo Bear was coming. And Pedo Bear was the idea of a me meant to be sort of a cute looking bear that was described as a pedophile. And so they were trying to basically mix the furry meme uh, with, the, with the pedophile thing and it was We'll stay out of the details. Anyhow, they um, did this across all of her forums. They basically started this whole mechanism. And they managed to get Oprah on live TV talking about how this new terrible threat of people wearing furry costumes that were out for kids. And it was one of those moments where you're like, oh, please tell me you just did not do that. Um, and of course, this is, this is the same community that had fun with um, Rick Astley, managing to get him an, another award um, in ways that you never thought that singing um, Never Gonna Get You Up is gonna be a good idea ever again. Um, but they did this, and this was that playful group. So there's these memes that happen as part of sort of everyday cultural dynamics, and they're the ones that come from the underbelly because they're having fun. Um, Oh, the thing about 4chan is there's a bazillion of them that are local. Well, they're not geographically local. They're socially local. There's a bazillion of them that are socially local, but the big ones go really, really, really big. Oh, the donut's totally local. That's what I'm more interested Yeah, the, those dynamics, I mean, and that's most of it. It's like those little playful things. It's just the in-jokes. It's the humor. It's the fun. Yeah. Um, go for it, Amy. Okay. So um, someone, before you mentioned bullying, asked, what's your take on using that word? technology for bullying, and he would love for you to expand on that. Sure. So the question for, for those in the ether um, is uh, about bullying. Um, I want to sort of put a context to bullying, because I think that this is one of the areas that's currently most misunderstood. Um, bullying is one small piece of a broad spectrum of meanness and cruelty. Bullying is one of those weird terms that actually scholars have purposefully located and tried to define in order to be able to measure it systematically over the last 30 years. Um, what is really ironic is that researchers and, and teenagers usually never have the same language for things, um, and this is the one exception to it, where 
bullying is defined by scholars as psychological, physical, and social aggression repeated over time by people of differential physical or social power. Needless to say, teenagers don't say that. What they say is it's the big kid picking on the little kid, it's the cool kid picking on the geek. What's challenging is, is that popular discourse around bullying right now uses that word to refer to every aspect of meanness and cruelty from teasing to criminal harassment. The challenge with using it for that broad spectrum is that the interventions you need to do across that spectrum are very, very different. Um, now, why is it important that teenagers use this language differently? They actually refer to meanness and cruelty with a variety of different languages. They will refer to bullying when they feel like they're in a state of being seriously disempowered, either as the victim or because of a variety of issues that are going on as the bully themselves. Young people will often use language like drama or pranking or punking or just a whole slew of other lo localized terms to refer to the things that are more interpersonal conflict, best friends that fall apart, um, usually over liking somebody else, or a variety of other sort of social issues. What's challenging is that when adults come in and look at that dynamic as bullying, they choose a, a victim and they choose a perpetrator. And they often get these dynamics wrong, and especially as we've moved towards more punitive measures, we've made a mess out of it all. And of course, harassment, it, it, criminal harassment should be dealt as criminal. And so then we end up with these moments of treating all forms of meanness and cruelty within the frame of that criminal. Now what happens online is really tricky. When I started this research, I expected that things would be far worse because of the internet. Um, I'd heard all of the anxieties, I heard the conversation about how things could just go from home into, or for school into home, etc. What has surprised me is that there's been a phenomenal number of scholars who've done really systematic research, national survey, uh, national sample surveys, rigorously done from a variety of different angles, and has found that if you stabilize the definition of bullying, we have not seen a rise in bullying in a significant way over the last 30 years. What's more challenging in light of all of this is that when you uh, survey young people now, you will find that they continuously report that bullying is far worse at school with greater emotional duress and with longer term consequences. So what's going on here? What happens is that if your child gets beaten up in school and comes home with a black eye, you know something happened. If he comes home grumpy, you sort of write it off as being another day in school. When you see what's happening online, you have traces of it and you think you understand the issues at play, but you often don't. And that creates these huge you know, misinterpretations of what's happening. Now, there's the other sort of issue of what happens because um, the, this meanness and cruelty extends from school into the home life through the technology. And I would argue that's probably true. I, you know, and for young people who are really hurting, that is a significant factor in what goes on. And yet, one of the things I kept hearing from young people is that so does their support network, which is that when people are mean to them online, when they're at home, their friends rally around them, and that becomes really advantageous. And so things aren't just extending in terms of meanness, but they're extending in terms of support. And this is where I stumbled onto something that I sort of blew my mind and became a huge challenge for me. Um, a couple of years back, when FormSpring was the thing, it's a qu quite a lot like Ask.fm for those who are familiar with this, um, this question and answer service was regularly addressed in the media as being this terrible site of the worst and the worst of meanness and cruelty. And I was really confused by these, this, this anxiety, this concern. And the reason why is that with FormSpring, when you receive a question, you, it only appears on your profile when you choose to answer it. So I kept scratching my head. Why are young people responding to the meanest of meanest messages that they might get? So I called up FormSpring. I said, hey, can we talk? Can we try to figure this out together? And we puzzled it together. And they went back. And they looked at a lot of the data of the sort of ones that I identified that were particularly egregious. And they came back to me with something really startling. The same IP address was writing the message as the one that was responding to it. In other words, what we were seeing was teenagers were anonymously bullying themselves online and then responding to it. And sure enough, what followed was unbelievable amounts of support from their friends. And so we saw this dynamic of digital self-harm. Young people who would be cruel to themselves, say things anonymously that were bad about themselves in order to then rally their friends. So then Elizabeth Englander went and helped me survey a, large, uh, a larger population about this. And in the earliest rounds of this, we found that 30% of young people in that first survey admitted to doing this. And that's when we were like, what do we do with this, right? And so what does it mean that we've got this dynamic of where meanness and cruelty and being able to stand up and respond to it are part of the ecosystem? Now here's where I back up, back up again. 
Meanness and cruelty is not just something that is experienced by young people. We have actually turned this into a national pastime. We think that meanness and cruelty is the way that we should convey news. We think it's entertainment because this is what we put on our reality TV shows. Um, and worse, I go into tons of homes and sit at family dinners and whatnot, and here parents complain about bullying and how terrible things are with kids while sitting there and talking smack about their uh, bosses and colleagues at work. Meanness and cruelty is very much modeled around all of these young people's lives in a ton of different contexts. And guess what? They're emulating it everywhere. And they're emulating it in ways that get support in really complicated ways. And so I really struggle with this because I've started to come to the realization that we cannot intervene as a way that we think about young people only. We have to think about this societally. And indeed, the researchers who have been doing interventions on bullying have found that when you do things like social emotional learning interventions, what's really critical is not just focusing on the young people, but it has to be a community-wide project. It requires teachers. It requires parents. It requires religious leaders. It requires everybody coming to the table and participating in this process. What kills me is that around the rhetorics of cyberbullying, we have used this to drive um, legislation in pretty much all of the US states um, that require punitive approaches, especially by schools, um, in ways that actually are showing to make things much, much worse. Um, and so I really struggle with this dynamic, because if we want to actually make a difference around bullying, if we want to make a difference around meanness and cruelty, our current punitive approach is going to make everything so much more terrible. I'll go to the side first. Um, can you tell me where you think, like, in two, three, five years, uh, this is going to be like where our teens going to be. And so the question is two to three, two to three, five more years. Where are things going? A um, couple of things is that everything is going to go uh, visual. Um, so the idea of textual as being the dominant way of participating is going to disappear more and more um, for the very simple reason that uh, being visual is a way of avoiding a whole set of search queries. Um, it's a way right now, um, and of course, many of you, of you in the room are working on undermining that one. Um, <laughs> so, visual is a sort of way of having some sort of control over things. Things are also going to be about um, the phone. Um, but what's really fascinating about the combination of visual and the phone is that we're going to see a lot of production of um, visual that sort of allows you to play with things. I mean. My, my GeoCities hat on of like, you know, the old, old days is absolutely rolling over laughing at the idea that animated GIFs, now called GIFs, are back. Like, this is great. Um, but animated, or the idea of GIFs being back is a way of sort of playfully dealing with visual media. I'm seeing a lot more of that. Um, I'm going to see a lot more of playing with sort of the obvious constructs of how things should be. Um, we're not going to see a one-size-fits-all application like Facebook again. Um, and I think that that's... I don't think the business community has gotten their heads around this, certainly not the venture capital community. I'm still trying to get my head around $19 billion. Um, we're, not going to, we're not going to see a one-size-fits-all app, uh, but we are going to see a whole slew of different apps. And part of it, it makes sense. You know, Think about it. You're a teenager. What is fun about hanging out in a space where your mom is also hanging out with her besties? Like, that's just weird, <laughs> right? So the thing is, is that we see this sort of movement to trying to go to a place where it's sort of more your place. But that also means that we're going to see, you know, differences across socioeconomic spectra, across, um, you know, communities, et cetera. The place where I sort of raise a warning sign around this is that people will be paying attention to the sites and services most used by the privileged youth. And I think that this is going to be a really tricky set of issues. Um, I saw this when we were split between Facebook and MySpace, and it's going to get uglier in this way. Um, but I do not expect a one-size-fits-all. I see certain trends, but not one-size-fits-all apps. Back there. Uh, like sort of the, the disassociation that's happening with teens in terms of, like I have two 13-year-olds, and like they don't use their phone to actually speak. They yeah. use it for text and for games and for you know, liking things on Instagram. Yes. And I and and so and they're also in that stage, right, where they're starting to like boys and you know all that kind of stuff, right? But they they will say things and communicate in a way um, textually that they that they cannot do face to face. And so, which is really super troubling for me. Um, and do you think that's going to just continue and get worse? Yeah. <laughs> or, so. 
Yeah, so I was sitting with a, a teen boy, um, and he was working on trying to flirt with a girl that he, was, he had a crush on. And he basically spent an hour trying to, per to craft the perfect 160 character message that looked like it was casually written, right? <laughs> um, and that was this, this amazing moment of just like, this is fascinating. And what, of course, you know, you realize is that there's nothing fun about flirting. It's awkward, right? And so especially if you're a teen um, and you're trying to figure out how to sort of flirt with somebody else and doing that in person and being rejected and all of those questions of anxiety that many of us in the room haven't gotten over, right? Like that is challenging. Um, and that moment of taking that risk um, and being rejected, there's a way of setting, setting an emotional distance from it that becomes very valuable through this textual medium. This becomes both a blessing and a curse. Um, and I'll say this because, uh, you know, I'm watching young people sort of experiment with this, make sense of it. I'm also watching them do it because they don't have options to hang out in person outside of school. And you know what? School just is not the best place to flirt. Um, so, you know, there's this challenge of like, where do they have moments of truly being able to hang out um, with their broader peer groups? Um, that goes back to sort of the changes that I was talking about. But one of the places where it's actually been sort of turned on its head and where I'm trying to figure out how to ramp this up and um, especially for those of you who do sort of more um, learning algorithm type work, I'd love to talk to you on this because um, I'm on the board of a uh, service called Crisis Text Line. This is a place for young people to text with counselors. This is a lot like the old hotlines, but what we've learned is that um, even historically, young people weren't calling hotlines. Um, they called them once they were actually considering suicide. But getting them to sort of back up before you're at that level of crisis and work through with counselors to get help um, was extraordinarily difficult. We made a bet that we could actually do this via texting um, in a really significant way. We have not even begun advertising um, the uh, system that we have put in place, and we receive over 100,000 text, uh, text conversations. We have 100,000 text conversations with counselors per month with youth. Um, and this is young people who are reaching out for everything from how do I come out in my community to, um, you know, I'm dealing with my mom abusing me to I'm, you know, thinking about suicide. And that emotional distance that at one hand can be so challenging can also be something that allows young people to connect, to make a difference, especially when young people are really, really struggling. Now the thing about, you know, the reason I'm going to sort of refer back to the learning folks is that we also realize something important about the data that we could acquire this way, which is that we can actually start to see what kinds of counseling are working with what youth based on the data analysis that we see in terms of what's coming in. When do they turn off? When do they not engage? What is not working in terms of those distances and those dynamics? We can also start to see patterns across the country um, and we are indeed seeing patterns around LGBT issues, around bullying issues, places where communities aren't handling it. And so there's this amazing moment to then think about how to deal with young people holistically and to use this moment of distancing. Now, what I'd say back to your broader concern in terms of your children is that, yeah, it's going to be different. Um, and I hate to say it, but it's going to be different for the rest of their lives. Many of you have to actually interact with your bosses via email or with other colleagues via email. You have to interact with people in a textual medium, even if you'd rather pick up the phone. I always have to say it's fascinating for me in this company when I get calls from the sales organization, because I'm like, phone? Wow, you called me? I'm like, what are you doing? Um, and it's like, I'm reminded that some, you know, there's, there's a division even in this company about how we operate. Um, and many of us do communicate by text. These are different ways of communicating. They have different strengths. They have different weaknesses. How do we make certain to put them into the context, uh, contexts where those strengths can be really used? And how do we make certain that young people are pushed towards environments where that's not the perfect envir environment for this? But this is where I come back to that issue of letting young people be hanging out with their friends. The book starts out um, in... in Nashville, um, because it starts out when I was at a, a high school football game, which is one of the things I continuously see in, this, in the US. Um, parents are saying, oh, young people, they won't get off their devices. But whenever I go to these environments where young people are allowed to sort of roam with their entire class, they're not on their devices. They're talking to each other. They're socializing. They're flirting. They're doing a variety of things. They're picking up with their phones to coordinate. They're, you know, they're actually answering them. When, and whenever they answer them, the next thing out of the mouth inevitably is, Mom, right? So that's the only one who's ever calling. Um, uh, and they're taking pictures. But the thing is, is that the more time that they have to do those face-to-face -face environments, the more that they will learn this. Communication, interaction, you have to learn it. And we can't just sort of you know, create a sort of separate isolation box for young people until they turn 18 and then expect them to be able to socially navigate this world. They won't. 
Yeah. You've done research on what is the age that kids kind of transfer from the peer to peer, like at a very young age, to primarily having their social interactions, you know, via technology or you know, textual interactions. Um. So first, it's important to realize that the transition from acknowledging that your classmates are um, just classmates to acknowledging a whole process of friends does vary. You hit it in versions around elementary through middle school. There was a gendered aspect to this. Girls recognize sociality um, statistically at an earlier age than boys. Um, and I say it's gendered because there's a lot of variation around um, kids who do different kinds of gender identities. Um, and you see this factor playing out in significant ways. There is no magical age. You will find 14-year-olds who are extraordinary social and you will find 14 year olds that are like huh what people um, and you know and, and I have to say you know as, as a geek and as many of the other people in the room we might have probably been on the delay end of that thing statistically um, and so I think it's sort of a really tricky thing so in terms of friend a uh, face-to-face versus technologically mediated it really comes down to the environment what they're in and w how much freedom they have at that point where they start paying attention to their friends and i will acknowledge that this is a collective action issue which is that if you as a parent allow your kids to go out and be able to do whatever they want but none of their friends are allowed to guess what it's always going to be about the devices um, and that's one of the big challenges that I see in a lot of more privileged communities. But it's not really about the devices, it's about where can I go to see my friends? What kind of freedom do I have? Um, and how much is somebody's mom going to be looking over all of our shoulders? Um, and I keep saying it as mom because that is what I hear from young people. Um, it's really about moms. Um, interesting, I will say a little side note. Grandmas are like an amazing special case in all of my field work. They're allowed to look in on anything. They're allowed to comment on anything. Grandmas are especially cool. So, like, the thing about it is, is like, get your get your parents involved. Like, get your parents involved as just being wacky and crazy, because they're they're amazingly loved. Um, uh, so I just like, I feel like we need to sort of do a lot more adopting of older people and just get them to sort of hang out because they're like they're allowed to be crazy. Um, but it really it, this variation is less about the technology and the age and more about the kind of social constructs, not just for your child but the whole group. Yeah. I have a question about uh, the need for external validation. So that goes not only for teens, but across people of all ages. The very fact that Facebook and other social media is so active is, hey, I did something and I want external validation. Oh, that hat looks cool or OK, the best you cooked is awesome. Mm -hmm. And I see people under pressure, teens and adults alike, like, hey, somebody posted something. Now I'm morally compelled to like it, because if I don't like, the friend would feel bad. Yeah. So a pressure among teens, how many friends you have. Yeah. So there is some kind of competition going on between, OK, I have 20 friends, and I have, on my post, I have 50 likes versus yours, which got only three. <laughs> and uh, people kind of, again, on the other side of the spectrum, kind of liking things without even reading it. Because it is my duty to like it. it is. I'm not liable to read everything which you have posted. A real example is somebody posted, hey, my mom died. And two things happened. Within five minutes, there were 10 people who liked it. So I don't know. I mean, if somebody's mom dies, what is there to like? I mean, there is something to feel sad about. And for the person who posted it, I mean, the first thing you should be doing is arranging for the funeral or maybe cry your heart out rather than seeking a validation from your friends, hey, my mom died. So. I mean, among, among the teens, is that need for external validation kind of growing, or do you see that, hey, it has always been there, just that the medium has changed? Okay. So the question for the ether is about um, external validation and the process of liking. So a couple of different things to keep in mind. Um, First, there's an amazing amount of uh, anthropological scholarship uh, by a man by the name of Robert, Robin Dunbar. And he talks about how um, you know, monkeys do a lot of grooming. Humans do a lot of gossiping, and it actually provides a lot of the same mechanism. We tell stories, we share, because if I make myself vulnerable to you, you will do so in return, and it's a way of building these connections. We Humans are social creatures, and that becomes really critical. Another really important set of literature I want to sort of tag, and then we'll come back into this, um, is uh, work um, sort of a book called Geeks, Freaks, and... Um, Ah, I can't remember. I'll, I'll come back to you if you want to know it. But the, um, what he argues, um, 
Murray Milner Jr., what he argues is that young people, one of the few things that they have control over in their lives is status. Everything else is taken away from them. Status is the one thing amongst their peers that they have complete control over. And so this is one of the reasons why we see popularity dynamics, where we see all sorts of hierarchies and whatnot. All of what works out and what is acknowledged within the status dynamics of young people and, for that matter, adults, are locally understood norms of recognition and support and validation. So then we see this technology that is you know, being used across the globe, and it's being used very differently. So this is where the like is a really funny one, because people have this really odd mechanism by which they can acknowledge somebody else, by which they can nod. And indeed, that's how a lot of people end up using it, is that they're not necessarily actually meaning like. They're being, I hear you. I acknowledge you. And that's part of one of the challenges that we have online, because you know, in this situation, when I'm saying things, you're sitting here nodding along. It's a way that I can actually recognize that you're understanding me, and I can modify what I'm saying in the hopes of reaching you. Right? And this is part of the challenge of communication. In a media environment like Facebook, what ends up happening is that I don't have a good way of saying, you know, are you actually hearing me? I've put this out. Do you recognize it? Are you listening? And so what we see is that the like button has become repurposed to do precisely that. It is a way of trying to acknowledge it. And I might not have a comment. It might not be so important and so significant that I can respond to you. But I want to acknowledge you that I've heard you. And that's where it's really tricky in this mediated environment of how do we find a way of acknowledging each other's humanity? How do we find another way of recognizing each other? And these new tools over and over again have found tr different ways of trying to work within that. Sometimes it's about that lightweight acknowledgment. Sometimes it's a lot more about status and, and, and concern about popularity and whatnot. This is fundamentally something that we have seen people struggle with all over the place you know, in every environment we've ever dealt with. Whether it's about what clothes you wear to prove that you have a certain kind of um, capital resources, whether it's about, you know, or you know, social awareness about what, what constitutes cool, whether it's about um, you know, the ways in which you are in the pecking order of, of you know, who owns what car, who ha lives in what building, who has what job. There's all of these mechanisms of things that, that are part of our life that we use this way. For young people, a lot of it has been about these social mechanisms. And what's been very interesting is that adults have done it too. Um, the result of which is that, I will say, once adults got onto Facebook and were doing it themselves, they calmed down about teenagers, which was kind of nice, um, because you realize that we're not that different. I think one of the challenges is how do you deal with the questions of insecurity, the, the lack of confidence, versus the dynamics of how to be appropriate within your, within your community. And a lot of that comes down to the questions of conversation. How do you say, like, why is it that we're ratcheting this up? Like, what is, what is appropriate about this? As adults, I'm saying, not even about teenagers, but like, why are we doing this, right? And sometimes there are very good reasons. Um, you know, every every sort of Microsoft group has their you know Twitter account where they try to get you know increase large numbers of followers. I will say one of the things that you know for those of you who are working in that space should know. I'm on to you. Most of you have bots uh, following you in large numbers. It's one of the things that kills me. And I started noticing how many of Microsoft accounts actually purchase bots to follow them to look like they're really important, right? <laughs> so we haven't stopped doing this even in a professional world, right? Because we want to be seen as important. Um, and it's one of the things that becomes really tricky because it plays out at our personal levels, it plays out at our institutional levels, and it really is about recognition. I'm going to go back over here. Engaging successfully with teens through or are they, or what do they need to do to do better? So the question is, how are brands um, successfully engaging with young people um, using media? Um, they're about as successful as they've ever been, uh, which is to say, not very. Um, they, uh, you know, if it fits into a young person's life, it fits into the status dynamics. Guess what? It plays out that way. Sometimes it gets appropriated in ways that brands are not necessarily cognizant of. Um, I had a very, very awkward encounter on a marketing panel uh, once because um, a representative from Coca-Cola was very proud about all of their social media marketing activities and was talking about how many friends they had and all this. And I burst out laughing, which is not a good way to make friends on a panel. Um, and the moderator comes to me and said, why are you referring to this? I'm like, I've noticed how popular Coca-Cola is, and that's not the Coke people are referring to. Um, so that's also these moments of reappropriation that don't go over so well. Um, one of the things I actually got confirmation at Town Hall, which was really exciting to me, um, uh, or maybe it was actually anyway, I got it, uh, this week. Um, so Facebook uh, had this sort of mechanism of what would appear at the top of the news feed. 
Um, and young people had quickly learned, um, and accurately so, that if they put uh, brand names into their posts, their posts would go to the top of the news feed amongst their friends. Okay. So I'd see these teens' posts with being like, um, La la, friend, 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 Nike. And I'm like, what, 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 why is Nike suddenly in there? And of course, they had figured out that Nike had been one of the brands um, that had paid to have things at the top. So there was a sophisticated way of understanding that kind of mechanism, um, which is a different way of using or understanding brand relationships. Um, when brands try to interact with uh, young people directly, they're as sketchy as any other adult that tries to interact with them directly. Um, so there's like a whole, like, why are you here, go away kind of feeling. Um, and it becomes a really tricky, you know, aspect. Young people are very aware of advertising culture. Um, they you know, don't necessarily like it. Their, their feelings toward it are about the same as adults. Um, but they uh, you know, want to be able to hang out with their friends, and so they're hoping all of it will go away. Um, that said, they will play with it. Um, so for example, um, whether we like it or not, Gmail is uh, sort of more popularly used amongst young people in schools. Um, the reason it is used amongst young people in schools is one of the few things that's not blocked because um, they don't block Google. Um, and so the result of which is I see a lot of young people during the day using Gmail to communicate with one another. They know the ads are there, and there's nothing funnier than getting your friends to get inappropriate ads. So you know, if you're 15 and you're like, you're like, I'm going to write these messages to my friend, and I'm going to you know, uh, white out the text, and my friend will get diapers ads. Yes, <laughs> right? Like that's funny. So this is that moment where that you see this kind of awareness because you see it through the playfulness. Um, but it's a way of sort of living in a world that is brand saturated. Um, they know it. But the other thing is, is that they've got very little control locally in terms of uh, where they spend their money outside of um, more privileged communities. Solar all of this. Yeah. Um, you had talked about some of the different factors that uh, affect teams. Um, both across geography and across socioeconomic status, but what about gender? Like, are there significant differences that play out between different genders and different gender expressions on social media? Yeah. So, the question is about gender. Um, the thing that I struggled with uh, in writing, sort of, or dealing with the gendered aspects of what I was writing in, in my book, um, particularly in terms of normative gender uh, practices, um, is that most of what I was seeing online reflected gender practices writ large, um, which is to say you know, all of the different things that we would see about how young people socialize, the way in which they form bonds, the ways in which they think about entertainment versus sociality, all of that gets reproduced online. I don't see anything that is magnificently or radically different about the online versus what is happening offline. Um, there are certain obvious power differentials that come uh, when we talk about gender. Um, and certainly, we see this in terms of how girls' sexuality is um, uh, you know, addressed writ large um, and uh, fears around sexuality. But even as I was surveying parents um, around uh, their fears about um, sexual crimes against their children, I was surprised to see how it was uniform across the board. It wasn't actually even just about girls, even though girls tend to experience the brunt of the cultural fear around it, um, which was sort of surprising to me. But, you know, I, I struggle with it because in some ways it's, it's, it, it mirrors and magnifies all of the dynamics that are already at play um, on each one of these different issues. And certainly even things like you know, bullying and drama, like drama is a gendered practice. It is a gendered uh, female practice. Um, pranking and punking is a gendered male practice. That doesn't mean that there aren't boys and girls that are doing the opposite, but that's how it plays out. Um, the other sort of aspect to take into about the gendered aspect of things is where um, this fits for queer youth. Um, and I want to sort of put one note of sort of caution because this is something I've struggled with with regard to queer youth. Um, when I, like I said, when I, was, when I was growing up as a teenager online, coming out was an amazingly safe space. It was, it was fabulous. You got amazing amounts of love and, and wonderful attention. Um, that really changed. Um, and the fear mongering that I heard among uh, queer youth about how um, strangers are dangerous really affected them most significantly. In the 1990s and early 2000s, we saw suicide rates decline correlated with coming out line for LGBT youth. Um, when, by the mid 2000s, um, young people that I was talking to were not willing to talk to strangers online, even when they were be getting beaten up at home, even when they were getting beaten up in school. And that was really, I was really struggling with that. Um, and then the It Gets Better campaign came in. And at first I was like, oh, this is, this is an attempt to be empowering. That's interesting. And then I started to see all of these teenagers make um, It Gets Better videos. And at first I was like, oh, this, is, this should be interesting. Like, what's going to happen? 
And I started realizing that the teenagers who made these videos really wanted love and validation and support, um, especially young people who are dealing with gender identity related issues, uh, but across the board of the LGBT spectrum. Um, and rather than finding community by making those videos, they were getting beaten up at school more. Um, and I was like, oh, that's really difficult. And one of the things, the pieces of data that I have not been able to work out, and I'm still sort of struggling with it, I'll, but I'll put it out there, is that in the year that followed um, Savage's creation of this sort of campaign, I tracked um, uh, reported suicides, uh, media reported suicides of LGBT youth. And many of those kids across that year had made It Gets Better videos. And I'm really struggling with whether or not I've got data or not, but one of the things that becomes really clear is that these issues of trying to deal with gender, trying to deal with sexuality in a very visible way, don't always get supported online, and that reinforces what's going on offline in ways that can be pretty damning. Yeah. So a couple of different issues. We talked, or you talked a little about a little bit about cyberbullying, mm -hmm. but you didn't really catch the situation where it's not necessarily somebody looking for validation from his friends, but true cyberbullying, bullying, where somebody is trying to alienate somebody else. And as a parent, I'm certainly very, very concerned about that. Yep. And I'm also, and you said that this doesn't happen very often, but as a parent, I'm certainly concerned about a predator scenario. How do, I mean, how can I protect my teen children yep. from both of those situations? Basically, sure. you know, life-altering events that will have a dramatic effect on them in the short-term and potentially long-term future. Yep. So, first, bullying. Bullying sucks online or offline. There is no doubt about that. It, there is no magical solution. Um, I know there are people here working in schools or working with schools. There is no magical solution. There is no one size, here's the way to protect your child from it. There's no way of saying we can stop what's going on. What you can do as a parent is really work on building out resilience and empathy. These are your two goals overwhelmingly. How do you respond to somebody who is hurting you with empathy rather than trying to retaliate? Because one of the other things you should know that in bullying situations, it is quite likely that those who are on the perpetration end are experiencing situations beyond that environment that you might not know about. Abuse at home, addiction, mental health issues, sexuality issues, a variety of issues going on. So figuring out how for your child to be as empathetic as possible, and that's hard in those situations. It's very, very hard and it's a process. The second is, is a structure of resilience, which is that all of us encounter negative situations in our life. Um, and when your, your children are on the receiving end of that, trying to build out that resilience, build out the strengths, finding the ways in which they can work with the situation and address it. It doesn't, you can't make the hurt go away. You can only work on trying to strengthen and, and give them different possibilities. You also, as a parent, you can't fix it. There's no way of punishing somebody and it will make it all better. And I think this is one of the things that's so hard as a parent because you want to be able to fix everything that's terrible to your child. Um, but that's one of the things, so that's one, you know, empathy and resilience. That should be sort of the mantra of trying to work with it, but it's not easy. And I can't give you a solution to it. Regarding sexual predation, so I, this was one of the ones that sort of killed me as I was trying to actually work through this. I'm going to go through some of the data in order to get back at what you can do. Um, first, there's an often misreported number um, that is used by the Ad Council, um, or rather misinterpreted uh, by the public number. You will hear numbers like one in five or one of seven um, kids are sexually solicited online. Um, that's accurate, but it's not what you think. Most sexual solicitations come from young people's peers. It's not about adults. Um, the uh, remaining part, most of them are about 18 to 22 year olds. Um, and the sexual solicitations that occur online, almost all of them young people continuously report, are not actually emotionally challenging. So then let's flip it. This is, by the way, the work of the Crimes Against Children Research Center, David Finkelhor, who's phenomenal. So Finkelhor went back in and decided, well, let's actually look at sex crimes involving children, involving the internet. And what he found um, was that most cases fit a very stereotypical portrait. This is about teenagers um, pretending that they are older, um, looking for sexual interactions online, usually on the services that were popular five to ten years ago, not the ones that are popular now. Um, seeking attention from older people, uh, knowing that they're older, knowing that it's about sex, meeting up in person knowing it's about sex, and doing so repeatedly, arguing that they're in love. 
Now, this is not to say that this isn't deeply problematic. There's a reason statutory rape laws exist. They're an abuse of power. Um, but the thing about it is, is that these young people actually fit a very particular profile. They are usually from households that are abusive. They are also usually faced with a plethora of other major issues in their lives. The cases of young people being attacked directly by strangers are rarer online than they are in any other context in which we operate. Um, that includes schools, that includes churches. And yet we focus on the online. We can't imagine excluding young people from church or excluding them from school, right? But we, ha we deal with this in, in this way that we think that we can solve it from the online world when we see these young people sort of reaching out and crying out for help. Another key issue, rape is real. Sexual victimization is real. Some of you in the room will have to face this either personally or because of your children. But the thing that's really hard about this is that you will most likely have to encounter it not in, at the hands of a stranger that you don't know, but at the hands of somebody in your community. Young people who are victimized are most likely to be victimized by their peers. Um, and what's really challenging to me is, is as we spend all of this time focusing on the idea of a stranger danger, of, a, of an online predator coming and reaching our children, we don't give them the tools or the wherewithal to deal with how relationship issues gone wrong. Significant, you know, a boyfriend um, that is drunk and pushes things too far. What do you do? A way of understanding the sexuality and the sexual expectations of your children is really hard, preparing them for that, not just about adults, but about their peers. And so no one wants to talk about sex with their children. It's not fun. But part of the big challenge in light of all the sexual victimization is that we actually have to start talking about sex. And we have to talk about what it looks like to have a healthy relationship. And when that relationship is abused in particular ways, because that is actually where things get really dicey. And I fear that one of the things that we use, especially around technology and, and sexual acts, is that we use technology to sort of take away the responsibility that we have on dealing with all all of these other complex issues. That we can't rid technology and then rid sexual victimization. In order to address sexual victimization, we have to empower young people long before they're actually dealing with sex. On that really uplifting note, um, I'm getting the sort of look. The exciting thing is that I do have books for sale, which um, sort of, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, um, which is sort of fun. I will sort of stand back there. I will um, sort of uh, autograph for anybody that wants it. Um, and I will answer more questions back there. But sadly, I have, to, I have to stop doing questions now. Thank you.